everyone. Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and today I'm very excited to introduce Josh Deming, who is the web and social editor and digital and digital editor at One Soccer. I hope I got that all right, Josh, uh, covering all things Canadian soccer. So uh, thanks so much, Josh, for for doing this. I've been a huge fan of your uh, your YouTube channel and now being at One Soccer. So thanks so much for doing this. Not a problem. It's a pleasure and I'm excited to get going. I, I want to first ask you, because some people might not know, but for you, you had a very successful YouTube channel in JJD TV. Um, how did you start that? Did you think when you started it that you wanted to get almost 10,000 subscribers? Like, wh wh how did that all come about? And then what was your thought process with uh, creating a YouTube channel? Well, I, I guess I, during COVID, um, I got laid off for only it ended up being a couple of weeks, but when I got laid off, I thought this was an opportunity because, you know, you have a ton of time. So I, I went up to my girlfriend and said, Hey, like, what do you think about me starting a like soccer channel? Um, I, a diehard fan as she would know. And she said, you go for it. Like you have an unlimited amount of time. If you're ever going to do it, try it now. So I did a lot of research on what to start because mm. it, it's, and it's a tough thing when if anyone out there is thinking of doing a YouTube channel, you have to, you have to split it into kind of mindsets. It's like, do you want to do this for fun on something that you're passionate about? Or are, do you, are you going to do it just simply because you want to get something out of it? Meaning some like a, a job down the line or just become big enough where you can, you know, just do YouTube for a full time. So I was torn, but I ended up going with a route of a little bit, a sprinkle, a little bit of everything because I'm a Dortmund fan. Yep. I saw that there was no Borussia Dortmund content going out there in English pretty much period. I mean, a few podcasts, which are, are pretty good, but nothing on the YouTube space, which is what I wanted to do. Talked to a few other hosts um, of different like club YouTube channels. And I thought that there would be something there, but I, in the back of my mind, I knew that it's still very unlikely that there's a market out there to do this full time. So my only objective when I began was to see what it would turn into be and get the attention of Dortmund themselves and hope to be um, so I set, a, I set a goal for myself to get Dortmund's attention before I started the channel mm. and hopefully end up working for them. Wow. So it, it kind of happened. Um, they did they did notice me right away and I ended up being a uh, like a fan influencer for them. I did a lot of I helped them start a project with um, a fan app where I, I featured doing videos on, on an international fan app. I was their Twitch host for a bit. Wow. Um, but then the money side of things and again that's why i'm like you gotta i'm doing it for passion but i i knew that you know you have there's only so much time in the day and life goes on girlfriend marriage you know like you only have an, a, a fine window to take advantage of what you want to do so i looked at it and didn't see an end goal of me basically being able to do it full time so then i talked to um my producer my best friend um which i have not mentioned yet but taylor sorry about that <laughs> me and taylor did it together <laughs> he, uh, he took, um, uh, like he, he did all kinds of like things in the TV side, broadcasting, uh, a lot of experience running a camera, editing videos. So we, we started together from day one and we had the same, again, the same objectives, everything was together. So I went to him and said, Hey, I, I, I don't think that like we got the goal, we got Dortmund's attention, but I don't think there's something here long-term where we're going to be able to, to make money because we're working full-time jobs and it just seemed very stressful with girlfriends and, and whatnot and trying to balance it all. Yeah. So we saw the rise of the Canadian men's national team. And just before their very first game, I'm like, I, cause I was kind of confused. I don't know what to do. So I was like, Taylor, you want to cover this game? Like, I mean, it's international break. I'm, it, it's their first game since COVID. Um, always loved the national team, but there's actually a little bit of promise here. We should do it. And we did one stream and it, it blew up. The numbers were absolutely incredible. And from there, we then did a shift with another goal saying that we're hoping we don't know how, who or, or, or what, but we were hoping to get, um, if we shift this attention with the World Cup coming up and hopefully this rise and what we're seeing on our YouTube channel, maybe there's an option down the road to, to get a full-time job because that's what we were looking for. Um, covered the national team, hit the right timing, and uh, month, months later, one soccer reached out and now Taylor and I are full-time there. Wow, congrats on that. And that's awesome. And what was it like for you to, to cover the, the men's national team uh, going to the world cup and covering them. Like, what was that for you? Did you, when, like you mentioned it briefly that obviously you 
thought they were on the come up, but did you feel as though they'd make the World Cup at the time? Like, did you think, oh, this is our big chance, or was it more just, hey, let's let's see what I, we can do here? It, it's tough because I've watched this national team for a very long time, and they have not been very good in my lifetime. Yes, they won a Gold Cup, but I was four when they did that, so I don't really remember. Aside from that, like again with with Davies coming up, there was like that little bit of excitement. Jonathan David, there's a few names and a few players that were really finding themselves in the MLS level. And I just looked across CONCACAF and said, man, like, honestly, on paper, like, this team is better than, I would say, probably, like, almost them, all, almost all of them, except for probably the U.S. and Mexico. But I know that it's CONCACAF. This region is very difficult. It's gritty. The Honduras, Costa Rica, Panama, I knew that they would be a threat. And my gut going into qualifying is that I truly believed that we were going to finish fourth and go mm-hmm. into that interconfederational playoff. Um, I went on a lot of podcasts and I've done my own prediction videos and I've never changed from fourth. And then uh, we had a series over on 11 Yanks where we did the CONCACAF council, which is a lot of fun. And I still always said fourth. I always said fourth until like the last couple windows. And all of a sudden this is like, okay, I'm changing my mind now. And then I end up, I end up going to second and then first and we finished first. So it, it's a really special group of players because it, this group of players I've covered like literally for game one um, of world cup qualifying and I got to cover it the whole way and it ended up leading me to my dream and career job. So it, I'm very grateful for this group and it was pretty cool to see this ride. And, and with that, what's it like now being like, what was the transition like for you going from having your own YouTube channel to, to one soccer now full time with Taylor and, and making all Canadian soccer content? It was, it was pretty, it was a pretty long process. Um, uh, Armin, got to give a big shout out to him. He's he's the one who basically fought for us to to come on, mm-hmm. and I, I I can't give him enough love for for believing in us and, and bringing us on. And um, it was very it was very un- surreal experience doing it and going up to Mississauga and and covering the games live with a uh, with a lot of great guys up there. But then just to know that we're you know that they they liked what we did and they onboarded us full time was really really cool um and it's it is what it is it's like i said it's it's a part of life um i'm I'm getting married next summer i thank you thank you but like it's just life comes at you kind of quick we're we're moving this year it's it's hard to juggle everything um and i actually funny enough just watched uh steve dangle put out a video um and his is his is funny enough a little opposite of mine so he started out with a successful youtube channel that got him a job with sportsnet and now he he's got a big enough platform that he can go the other way. So he's leaving Sportsnet to do full time. I never had that platform, but I knew that ahead of time. I didn't think just covering Dortmund or just covering um, soccer, like Canadian soccer or the national team, whatever it may be, would ever get me and Taylor big enough together. But I knew that I could use it as an opportunity to hopefully get a full time job. So when we got that full time job, we like we still have the channel. It's just we don't we don't post Mm -hmm. like we used to and we're able to put all our attention which is what I want to do on one soccer and do the best content we can do there. And that's kind of the direction that we went in and we're happy. And, and, and with that, I want to ask you before I ask you about the, the teams, um, the men's national team, and obviously we'll talk about the women as well. What, what have you seen in the me- the Canadian soccer media landscape since Canada made the world cup? Obviously the women were very successful. They won the gold medal two years ago, but have you seen a shift or is there a shift in terms of how it seems on the ground as someone in the the industry covering soccer in this country? I think, I mean, I, I'm very happy to join up with One Soccer because they like there's obviously a lot of media outlets. Um, One Soccer is obviously just about pre- pretty much Canadian soccer. We have the Canadian Premier League. We cover the men's and women's national team, all the youth programs and, and games and whatnot. So like... I feel like I got in exactly where I needed to be. Um, sometimes not a shot at any of the other media outlets. They, they go quiet when the hype's not there, but obviously when it is there, they, they come out and they come out loud. Um, so I just wanted to do it on, on a daily basis. And it's been pretty cool to come up with four plus videos every single week on all kinds of topics surrounding the Canadian game from Canadian Premier League, MLS, Canadian Championship, the national teams and whatnot. So it, the media has definitely changed a lot and I, I put a lot of, I know if one soccer in the past has, has taken some heat, but I think that they're doing, and I'm biased. I mean, I work for them, but I think that they're doing the right kind of thing. This is the kind of content that I wish I had growing up. Mm-hmm. It, Canadian content came. I remember trying to stream gold cup games on some yep. ske- sketchy channel. I was the same. Yeah, no no was... coverage whatsoever. So 
I, you know, it's not perfect. We're, we're, we're working towards always getting better. And that's the kind of company I want to work for. And I'm, I'm hoping that Alex Armin and Taylor and myself who are part of the digital team are, are doing a good job out there for the, the media side of things. And hopefully it just, it keeps picking up because it's a crucial time in Canadian soccer with what we just did at a world cup. The first one in 36 years, we're hosting co-hosting one in 2026. We have a Copa America coming up two big tournaments with a legitimate chance at winning both. So it's, it's a good time to cover the sport and it's a good time to get into it. Mm-hmm. Um, you also have, you, you do live videos or live YouTube kind of, you're on YouTube live, I guess that's the right way to put it. <laughs> how do you prepare for that? What's your process or how do you think about how you interact with people on the chat? Like what, what how, what's your process for all that? That going live is, is something that I personally am almost like addicted to when <laughs> I, when I, when I first started trying to, to get noticed, uh, it's difficult because you want to do it in a way where you're not shoving things down people's face by like going into different groups, like going to Facebook groups and trying to promote your videos and doing this and doing that. And I don't, I'm not that kind of person to, to try to throw content that people don't necessarily want down their throat. So the, the beautiful thing I discovered early when I was covering Dortmund is like by doing live watch alongs, understanding the algorithm is that you actually put it in front of people who are, who are looking for it. So mm-hmm. it gives you more of an opportunity for people to look at you live and then be like, oh, why are you, why, why did you put this video in my face? Why are you doing this? I'm not looking for that. It's the other way around. So I feel very comfortable going live for that reason, knowing that I am more than likely going to hit 80 percent of people that are looking for this or you know maybe they're probably looking for the game but they may not be able to find it and then hey like, this is a guy out here who's <laughs> my job to be entertaining to keep them a part of the stream and keep them a part of the community where they can watch a game with me and and talk and and it's difficult but it just felt more natural knowing that these people who are who are coming on and want to watch this game want to want to look for this kind of content so it kind of changed my perspective going live because it, it took a little bit of the pressure off when i never did it before um, and then just doing it time and time again, I've probably did a watch on for hundred plus games and the Canada stuff was, was surreal because they like at the time it was before one soccer, I think personally took off a bit because it was the first qualifying game. When I did my watch along, people were looking for the game and had no idea where to look because the national team, you know, this is working qualifying. This is kind of like a, like a spark in the interest. So it was nice to see, like we had like six, 700 people on wow. my first ever Canada watch along. Like there's six, 700 Canadian soccer fans out there. This yeah, is yeah. Crazy. And the numbers have been crazy. When we did the watch alongs for um, the world cup matches, the three games, we had, I think an average of like 3000 people Ooh. tuning in watching. Wow. And those are obviously including the people who are just watching the game on one soccer or on TSN or whatever it was at the time, but it's, they were tuning in just to hang out with, with me, which was, I thought in, in, in others as well, like um, Adam Jenkins was on there. So it was, yeah. It was pretty cool, but that's so the live will always have going live and doing games and covering is always have a special place in my heart because I don't think without it, I would have got the attention if if you kind of know what I mean, because I just don't yeah. think I would have the videos themselves would have done it. It's the the lives that get the interest, get the people in the door to then watch the videos and grow from there. Yeah. And then and now you you make more kind of you don't make live videos all the time. Obviously, at one soccer, you make ready made. I, I watched yours on where Jonathan David should go. And I, I really enjoyed that. What's that like to, to make videos on that aren't live and, and where you actually have to kind of more prepare uh, and, and edit and, and all that? Well, sir, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Certain ones need a lot of research because not that, not like the ones that I, that I don't feel come natural. Um, like, for example, uh, I had, like I did a Canadian championship preview, how they got there. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know right off the top of my head who scored every goal. So like, um, I went and obviously like I watched most of the games at the time, but I just don't remember. So I watched the highlights. I wrote my script while being, you know, say this is how the white caps got here. They played so and so and so. So you write your script, you try to make it entertaining, try to make it catchy. Um, and then you, I find a way to insert usually Alex. And then after like the intro, I brought in Alex and then just kind of like filled up the video with questions and talking about fun storylines. So there's a lot more prep work because there's a script involved. Um, and most of the times there's a script involved because it, it just naturally sounds better. But sometimes when you're, um, and I said passionate because I love talking about Jonathan David, Alfonso Davies and transfers, I was cutting my grass um, and in, in my head, I was just like, I wonder where David's going to go this summer. And um, I had a night, couple ideas in my mind, like, 
that'd be a cool video. I'm like, all right, well, how would I make it a little bit more interesting? So I was like, okay, well, I can grab maybe one team I like from each of the top five leagues and then yeah. rank them. And then I just went and showered and recorded and just spit it out in pretty much one take. Wow. Those are very rare. Um, I got a little bit of prep, you know, like write your, sh- like, all right, I want this team because of the so and so and so. But um, yeah, it's funny the ways that some ideas can, can come about. But that one, I was cutting the grass and just like, I wonder where he's going to go. And then I just kind of took off from it. But I got a lot of creative freedom with Armin. Um, he allows me to, like, we, we talk each, each Monday morning and we discuss what, what videos we want for the week. But most time, if I get an idea like that, I'll say, hey, Armin, I would love to talk about this. And he very rarely hits back. He's like, go for it. So it's yeah. pretty cool. Awesome. That's great to hear. And I want to now move to to the men's national team a little bit. Um, they have a huge semifinals against Panama, and then they have the Gold Cup. How important would it be for them to to win one of those tournaments? And and how likely do you think that is the case? I I think it's I think it's very likely, especially for the Nations League. I think that we have just as good of a shot as the U.S. and Mexico for a few different reasons, but. It almost feels like the timing is here. It's been 23 years since Canada's won that unbelievable gold cup that they struck in 2000, but they are on this rise. And the feedback you hear from different fans, especially from Mexico and the US is like, you have nothing really to show for it. You don't have that silverware. If you want to build and continue to get better and attract you know, dual nationals, you got to start winning. You need to prove that it's your time. And with everything that this rise has has meant to the Canadian fans, seeing them finally get over that hurdle to qualify for a World Cup, that they played so well in qualifying. Uh, they did well in Gold Cup as well, getting that semifinals, very unlucky not to to make it through. They had striker troubles and with injuries going on in that tournament with no Davies and David. So it feels like all the pieces are coming together. I said it was like the last hurrah, especially for the Nations League, because we don't know what Atiba is going to do. I mean, 40 years old, what a story it would be for his last every game to be able to, you know, wow. lift that trophy. Vittoria Borean, I think, will still be around for a while, but Wotherspoon, Cavallini, like you got some guys who have been a big core of this program for a while, and this is kind of like a huge opportunity for them to go out on a high and also let some of the doubters out, out there know, like from the U.S. Mexican side of things, being like, hey, we, we, we're we here to play too. We're here to compete. It's not just a two-horse battle anymore. There's There's three of us, so... I think the timing to do it is perfect. I think that the team is pretty much, I mean, like we don't know about Cornelius's injury at the time of recording. And I mean, Davies is obviously fit, but I don't know how fit is he going to start? He can play 70. He's going to come off the bench. Like we don't hundred percent know, but it's, it's still a pretty good feel. And then for the Mexican and U S side of things, this is Mexico's darkest time in their history. The last two years pretty much has been a disaster from them at pretty much every stretch. And for the U S I mean, you know, like they've had a, I think they've had a pretty successful year in a bit. It's just like they now have the assistant to the assistant um, as their head yeah. coach right now. Yeah. A little confusing going on there. And on top of that, a lot of their star guys, when you look at the the, the core starting 11 for the U.S. versus Canada. Yes, I mean, the U.S. is, and it's a fun debate. I just had it, but um, the U.S. players are playing at a bit of a higher level. Not all of them. I mean, there's a lot of Canadian players that are playing at a high level, like Porto, Bayern, and, and Lille, but a lot of the U.S. players are not in great form. They're players that are are getting relegated, that are not playing well, they're not scoring, that are not starting. So um, the core, like, 15 guys of the of the Canada team are all pretty much playing for their squads and playing well. So I, I just feel like this Nations League is going to be so important. I think it's the one that Canada is two matches away from getting. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously they play Panama in the first game. Uh, how do you think, like, should that be... I don't want to say it because it feels weird as a Canada fan to say it. that feels almost like a rollover, but what, what should Canada expect against Panama and, and should it be a confident win? Is that kind of the expectation? I don't, I don't think I would say Canada are the favorites going in. I think they have every right to get called that, but they're, there's definitely not a team that's going to roll over. This is a team that's well coached is a team that's gritty. Any, honestly, any team in CONCACAF, I mean, despite what qualifying looked like to a lot of the newer Canadian soccer fans, this is still a very difficult region. And you've seen matches where Canada has lost and not been able to pick up points, gritty 1-1s, 0-0s that are are tough because these teams can dig deep and and make it very difficult for Canada to play, especially the the gap between the two is a little bit higher on the Canadian side. So that just um, allows for Panama to play a different type of way. And anything can happen. I mean, when you saw... Like, I mean, it's also the, this game with Mark Anthony K picking up that red card 
against yeah. Costa Rica. Like it is what it is. Like it's probably a game that they were looking good at the time, but you never know what's going to happen. So it's absolutely not one where like Panama's going to ro- roll over. I if I had to put a prediction, I'd say it's going to be a one, maybe two goal game. It's going to be tight. Mm-hmm. It's going to be close. It's going to be tough. I just think that Canada, like I said, are in the mindset right now that they should believe that they can get through it. They are the on paper the better team, and I think that they have the confidence to be able to to do it, knowing that this is the kinder draw because you could have got yeah. the U.S. or Mexico. So they have a clear path to the final. It's just whether they can take it. And and I want to ask a little bit because the the roster was um, announced yesterday, and obviously I don't think there was any big omissions. But were there any surprises to to who Canada is bringing into that game against Panama and maybe into the finals? What do you make of the roster? I I like the roster. Uh, I like I said, if you would have told me this roster looks like John Herdman's kind of core core guys over the last like year or so. I probably been pretty close on picking the team. I mean, maybe I would have put K in there over like a Latouri for like Herman's perspective because of the guys who've been there, but it's, it's a no nonsense type roster. The only thing that I was, I guess, a little bit surprised about was, um, well, maybe not surprised, but just like Cavallini again, he's one of Herman's guys. He got the call over like a Ugbo who's not playing well in a top five league and like a brim who's playing in not a high enough level in my opinion but he's playing very well so went with kind of like the old guard there and then the big news was obviously uh aiden morris who if you follow me on twitter and what and you've seen me on one soccer you know that'd be pretty disappointed with i really thought this was a an opportunity the, the reports were that they called him he was supposed to be in this 23-man squad it's just whether he said yes or no he clearly said no his heart seems set on the u.s so not a great um it's not a great do you Sorry. think that ends the speculation to canada like he's decided to go to the states or what, what do you make of that because i don't think he's in their nations league roster or... he's he's not so i'm i'm a little torn i don't know exactly what like i think canada canada's pushing hard for him um i think that i think that then the gold cup will be very telling i find it hard to believe that he rejected the nations league just to accept the gold cup for canada i think if I'm again, this is pure speculation. I, I think like Herman said, his heart's with the US, but there and I don't think there's any reason why the US wouldn't call him, but the US does have a lot of depth in that area. And I I feel like there's a good chance that they call him. And if they do, he'll probably accept it, play at the Gold Cup, play at the Olympics for them, and it's a done case. As soon as he accepts that Gold Cup call, it's over. But if he doesn't make that roster, because there, like I said, there is a lot of depth, a lot of CMs out there for the US, then maybe he holds off. Um, maybe does a camp with Canada in a friendly maybe he waits to see what the U.S.'s coach is going to be. Maybe he plays in the Olympics for the U.S., but then doesn't commit because it won cap time. It's it's hard to know, but I would say pretty pretty openly, I, I feel like it's not looking good. I've, I don't think by the way he's playing, the U.S. won't call him in, and okay. I think he'll accept it. So I, again, I don't know. Like I said, the goal top will, will be telling, but right now I'm not holding my breath. I feel like it's a tall task to think that he might play for Canada soon. I want to ask a, about a couple dual nationals as well. Like, is there any, what do you think about Cody Osho, Jebison? Is there any others that you think might, maybe aren't ready to to make the squad for Nations League, but good enough to to make Gold Cup when there's probably a bit lesser squad? I think Davies just said he's not going to play and probably more of a B team or just a younger team at, at the Gold Cup. Yeah, like I think like Wheeler reported on it and it's, somewhat like it's kind of like i think it'd be similar to the 2021 team we had i think a core group of those guys from the nation's league like probably like your your mls core and like some players that are comfortable in their their club situation that aren't in a rush to find a new club like that could rule out like a scott kennedy for example it could rule out an ek ugbo um but maybe like a, a zator who's comfortable just made that move to poland could be in so like i do think like 15 or so guys will probably be on the gold cup squad so it will still be good it's just i mean i could probably see a scenario where Davies, David, Laren. I don't know about Eustachio because he is comfortable, but maybe he wants the summer off. Uh, and then you fill that in with younger players. And I don't think Cole Yosho is, and I've, I've said this a few times, I don't think he's in any rush to make a decision. Still very, very young. He's flirting with the, the, the Italians, the, the Canadians, the U.S. So, like, he's got options. He doesn't need to make that decision now. And seeing him come off the bench for Espanyol in La Liga and score that goal you know he's still he doesn't need to make that decision anytime soon there's still a ton of youth football for him to play especially if he's going in the italian direction and then he can make a decision from there so and i would say literally probably like one percent that you'd you'd see him Mm. Uh, i i personally think daniel jebison there's something there uh okay 
I put a tweet out that I mean, when I tweet about Jebison, people love it. Same as <laughs> just he just he's a popular guy within Canada, yeah. and Canadians really want him. But like he, like I said, he, it's similar to Cole Yosha at the time when people wanted him to represent Canada. He still had a lot of youth football left. Uh, he was in a good England setup. He's very, very far away from ever representing England at the national team level. So it's not really a rush for him. He, and in my opinion, at the time, he probably wasn't even good enough to get called up for Canada. It's just, you know, trying to get a dual mm-hmm. national in the door. And he basically went with the England direction at the youth level. He just went to this U20 World Cup, which is a big opportunity. However, this he didn't start any of those matches. He didn't feature much. He didn't do a whole lot. And England got bounced out pretty early in, the, in that tournament. And then the next day, he's announced on the uh, preliminary roster for Canada. So yeah. his, like his youth time is basically over. And the fact that he didn't star for England in that tournament, I don't think puts him any, obviously, closer to the national team. He's just so far away anyways. So I can see him, and again, this is me speculating of just taking a look. I just think that conversations are there. Herman's talked about Jebison every once in a while. So it wouldn't surprise me if he's one of those young players that will get an opportunity now that his England youth career is is over. So I would say keep an eye out for Jebison, but I mean, you never know. He 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 may say no. I want to focus on you know because he might need to transfer as well now that Sheffield United went back up to the Premier League. I doubt he's going to get any minutes up there, so he'll probably find a loan. So again, that could have, have some type of impact as well. But he's one I I would keep an eye on the next year or so. And uh, we always do this on on Twitter. I always basically DM you at mass just to ask you about Jonathan <laughs> David and Tejon Buchanan. So I want to do this on a podcast because I think it might be a, a better form for this. Uh, you mentioned Jonathan David and everyone should check out the video you made for, for one soccer. Um, but just in your mind, what do you think is the most likely destination for Jonathan David? It's tough. And I can't get this out of my head. It's, it's really tough. So I've said this many times. There's a statement where Jonathan David said, I can't see myself playing anywhere else in the Premier League. So I don't have anything else to go off of. Like there's been no legitimate reports really of clubs like concrete interest in him. And the fact that he said Prem tells me Prem. But I also think that, and, and I had a few, a lot of comments in the, the video I did on him saying like, well, what about Brighton? What about Austin Villa? Like, why are you ruling out these guys? Now West Ham who have Europa League football because they won the conference league. Like, wouldn't these be good fits? And I just... Not that they wouldn't be good fits, because I think he could thrive in those systems. I just think the interest of a bigger club would really be appealing to him. And I think it's tough, but like the only thing that is going in my mind right now is Tottenham. I think really? the fact that, I mean, Ange is going there, who's a manager I absolutely adore. I think he's going to have a rude awakening in that Spurs system, but I think that hopefully being able to, because they're just perfectly set up to defend. That 3-4-3 three, three defensive style, it's going to be hilarious to watch... Uh, and try to turn that into an attacking football the way he likes to play. But I think if Harry Kane ends up going on and moving on to either United or Real Madrid, that's going to give Tottenham a ton of money. They have no European football this season. They are a big club, beautiful stadium. They're expected to get back into Europe, new manager. It, it feels like a situation where they have the money now because David is an expensive player to bring in a Jonathan David, playing that attacking 4-3-3 system. He just spent a whole year playing as a, as a lone striker. I think he would thrive in that system. And because, yes, no European football sucks, but, you know, you're, you got your prem move. This team should push for top six or so, maybe Champions League. Um, and I think that gets, gets him where he wants to go. And I, I just, that's the only, really the only scenario I can see, because I just, I think the Victor Ossiman, Harry Kane kind of saga where, the, where they'll go is going to maybe determine where David goes once those guys are, their futures are determined because if awesome and leaves, well, Napoli needs a striker. United still need a striker. I don't know where they're looking. Uh, Bayern need a striker. So it's, it's hard to tell, but I think the pressure playing the prem is difficult, but maybe knowing that, you know, you just lost Harry Kane, new manager, you have no European football. Like it almost takes a little bit of the pressure off for a David just to naturally kind of come in there and help this team try to get back to their best. Yeah. And, and what I, what I find interesting and I want to know what you think is, it feels as though every the last two summers at Lille, there's always been rumors that David's going to go and then he doesn't. Is is there? What's the chance that that happens where he stays another year for you, Josh? I I would say I would say low. I, this year to me feels different. The first year he won the league on title, but he had he only scored 13 goals that season and he had a lot of like droughts throughout the season. Like he'd be very hot. He'd score like five or so in a ch- like a small chunk of time and then he'd go like eight or nine games that a goal and i think that threw off a lot of clubs um 
and then that Lille team was also getting picked apart and other players. So like they needed to hold on to some of their core. He played another season, scored 15 goals. Still, it was a, it was a Jocelyn Gorvinek really ruined the way that that team was, a uh, was progressing. Mm-hmm. And he again, scored in bunches and had long goalless droughts. So I think those two things were, I, I would say a big reason as to why he didn't get a move. And also I personally believe that at the time, like he might have been able to get a move last summer, but I don't know if it was exactly where he wanted to go, which is why, like, when you ask me, like, in the comment section, why not an Austin Villa? Why not a Brighton? With no disrespect to those teams, I think if a Tottenham came, despite not having European football, they're a bigger club. They they have ambitions, and I think that he'd he'd rather that. I can't speak for David, but that's just my what my gut's telling me. So I think that now that he's had a 24 goal season, he's producing at a much higher level than he ever has. This is a career best for him. He's never had those massive goalless droughts. He's also doing it for the national team. He's got a crazy record for Canada. I think now when a club looks at him, it's like, all right, now he's, you know, he's getting better each season, 13 goals, 15 goals, 24 goals. Like he's ready for that step. He's made it very clear. There's a lot of reports saying that he's going to leave. He's going to leave. It's just, Mm -hmm. there's no destination as to where. So I, like I said, I, the way I'm reading it is the fact that I think other strikers need to move for other clubs to know what is out there. Once Ossiman's situation's figured out, once Keynes is figured out, maybe Vlaovic as well, whatever these strikers who are on the market go, then I think there's going to be a club out there like Tottenham who is, who are they going to, like, honestly, who are they really going to attract yeah. once Kane goes? They have no European football. They're in a big turnover. But David, I think, would like that opportunity. And I wouldn't mind to see him at Spurs. I know a lot of people are like, why would you want to see him at Spurs? They're not going to win anything, but it's that jump that he wants to take. And I think Ange, despite what a lot of people say, I think he's proven that he's got a track record of being successful with the Australian national team in the Australian league, in the Japanese league, in Scotland. Like he's been successful everywhere he's gone. And I would like to see what he could do with a player like Jonathan David. And and with that, I want to go to another Canadian star in Tejan Buchanan. He's been great at Bruges. He's been linked to Inter a lot. Do you think he moves this summer? And, and where do, where would he go if, if he uh, transfers uh, this summer? Gets transferred. I, there's definitely legit interest from the reports that have been out there from Inter, but that interest has been very quiet of late. Tejan has not had the best season in Belgium. I I would like to see him move regardless. I don't know exactly where he'd, he'd go because I just don't think the way that... I mean, the, the season for, for Club Brugge this season was a disaster. Like, they've had... I believe, I don't remember the stat right off the top of my head, but I think they've had three or so managers, maybe like yeah. four or five total that David's had in the year and a half, he, or Buchanan's had in the year and a half he's been there. It's not good for a player's development. He's been playing at right back, left back, right wing back, left wing back, right wing, left wing. Like he's all over the park. He needs to find a position that he can get comfortable in and, and progress in. And I I would love him to go to Inter if he was replacing Denzel Dumfries, like, Sign, like sign me up. I think that's a huge, mm-hmm. huge step. I don't know if he's necessarily ready for that step, what he's shown this year. And I don't know now if, if Inter going to the Champions League, um, maybe getting a little bit more prize money, if they're going to even be able to afford him. I, there hasn't been those those links in a bit. I would Again, I would like to see him go to like like a Germany, go to the Bundesliga, find a club there that has like a Wolfsburg, maybe a Gladbach who could use mm-hmm. him. That's, that's maybe where I'd like to see him ideally go. Uh, I don't really don't want to see him stay in Belgium. I'd like to get him to go to Italy, but I just I don't know that this one's this one's reminds me almost like a David situation last summer. I I wouldn't be surprised if there's no move at all, but I would like to see him move just because I don't know if Club Brugge is the best destination for him still. Is there any other Canadian men's players that you think might be on the move this summer of like kind of high profile? Is there any way? I, I keep thinking about this that Alistair Johnson comes to Tottenham with Ange. To Tottenham. I put that out there, but I doubt it. I, I thought it was I thought it was funny because Ange is going to play probably his four three three system. Um, they already have a right back. They spent forty five mil on, so I doubt Johnson would come in. My thought is if he does switch up his shape and goes to like a like a three four three, which is what Tottenham plays now, then Johnson could be a good option at that outside right. But they do have some decent players back there, and I just I, I unfortunately doubt it. I think the type of players that might be in the move, I mean, E.K. Ubo needs a new club. He's been linked to Rangers. I think that'd be a great fit for him. Score some goals, get some confidence in a, in a club that's probably going to be very dominant in their league. Um, other than that, I think Atakubi's could be up in the air. I don't know if he's going to stay at Galatasaray or what the situation will be for him. Hoylet needs a new club. Maybe he'll stay in League One with Reading. Maybe he'll find another club in the championship. Other than that, I don't know if there's going to be a ton 
of movement. Uh, Borean might need a new club as well because they just announced Come to that. the MLS. Yeah, I don't know if he's. I don't. I doubt it. My gut would tell me that Borean will probably stay somewhere in a lower team in Serbia. Maybe he'll go back to Bulgaria. Maybe he'll go to Poland. He did play for uh, Krona Kielce, which is where Dominic Zator and Godinho mm-hmm. are. So there's that Canadian link right there. Uh, Scott Kennedy needs a new club. I'm hoping he'll find just another uh, Bundesliga two side. And that's pretty much all I can think of right now. So the the big the big one will be Jonathan David, and it should be a huge one. It should be a massive story. I'm ex- I'm dying to know where he ends up, and I can't wait to talk about it, break it down, see how he'll fit in. But again, that Tottenham shout is just a complete like yeah. shot in the dark because Harry Kane could very well be like, no, I like Tottenham. I don't want to move. I'm going to stay. So yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just hoping. Uh... I think it's in two weeks from now or like 10 days that he wins the nations league. And then, then he signs with Tottenham or Manchester United. Tottenham, I'm a yeah. Manchester United fan, but uh, yeah, I want to go to uh, the, the women's team and obviously they have a huge summer. They, they're playing the world cup. There's been a lot of friction with um, the, the women's team and the association or the federation. Uh, how do you feel about this women's team, the Canadian women's national team going into the World Cup? And and what would be a realistic expectation for this team at the World Cup? Well, it was, it's funny because growing up, like getting my Canadian success story was watching our women. And it was so, so much fun watching them in the Olympics. I always really enjoyed that. Mm. Uh, I've talked to a few. I won't, I won't let their names go, but just like some colleagues who who have some strong opinions on this women's national team. And I would say that their expectations aren't insane and and I hear their point. Um, And I I kind of agree with it. So I'd say just first things first, I would say like this team is probably like a quarterfinal type team. Uh, Maybe they can go on a fairy tale run, but I don't think the expectations are in the past to go on and win. I mean, the expectations are always, you know, you want to win it, but like in reality, looking at the way that this team is kind of lined up, I would say like a quarterfinal type Thing, maybe get to a semifinals fight for fight for uh, a bronze but it's t- it's tough like I don't know and I like I don't want, again I don't want to throw anyone under the bus but I just like I've heard I've heard some not confident um yeah talks about the national team not that they're gonna you know bust or anything but they have just, a tough like, group too like it's they, all, do. they don't have a bat there's like it's not a they don't have a world power per se but Australia uh, Nigeria played them really well. I know they tied them last year in BC. So like they, they have a tough group. So some um, well-established um, countries for sure. Yeah. Um, and with that, is there like, obviously they lost Janine Becky, which I think was such a huge blow for, for the team. How, how much impact will that have? Who might replace her at the world cup? Is there anyone that you think might break out for Canada at the world cup? Becky's a, a big loss. She's such a good personality as well to have. And it was heartbreaking to see that injury that's going to keep her out of it. Uh, in terms of breakout, I think this name is probably not going to surprise you. And I've seen a lot of different um, people Chloe out there talk about her. It's Chloe Lacasse. Yeah. Um, is that what you were thinking? Yeah. Yeah. yeah she is. Everyone just, everyone thinks that this is her time. She's done so, so well for Benfica. She scored so many goals. It's such a fantastic success story. She's been linked to going to England. I think Arsenal was, Arsenal? Was, yeah. Arsenal was the last club that I heard. She scored 70 goals in 74 games um, uh, <laughs> yeah. in the league. Like she's just, she scores at an un- outrageous um, pace. And I think that this World Cup is a perfect opportunity for for her to shine. I I, I do. I know Alex is who I, I like to talk to a lot about this. Um, you're going to talk with him soon. So I'm sure if you ask him, he'll say the same yeah. thing. She's the one to watch. Um, and it's just it like you kind of kind of talk about timing how I did with the, the men's. It seems like the timing for her to have this type of tournament is now, and also to get that move. So I think that it, you know, she goes off. Maybe she can get that type of move, go to an Arsenal or, or a club of that pedigree, and and hopefully just show what a fantastic success success story she's been. Do you, Do you think there's a chance that she starts like, or is it more like a super sub? Like that's what I've been thinking. <laughs> like at the World Cup, especially. I hope she starts. Although I have heard, don't be surprised if she doesn't. So, okay. I mean, it, it's, 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 just, uh, Bev's got her core as well, kind of the same way Herman does. So it's, it's not, it wouldn't surprise me if she doesn't start, but it also wouldn't surprise me if, for example, she comes off the bench 
you know, and, and like maybe the team's not playing well and she just gives that spark or maybe she scores their goal. And you've seen that in a lot of different World Cups, whether it's the men or women's side, a player coming on in these short games. You only got three games to get out of the group. And if you're not looking good and all of a sudden you can bring on a player who can make a difference, then that player usually ends up in the starting 11 for the next match. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know about the first match, if she will start or not. Maybe she will. It depends. But I mean, if she can do what she's been doing all season and score a goal or, or do something special, there's a chance that she could get put into that starting 11 and then hopefully carry on and, and score some goals like she I mean, definitely know that she can. What player do you think is key for Canada if they're going to be successful at the World Cup? I like to look at Jessie Fleming. I love yeah. her game. I look at her and maybe Grosso um, in the midfield. I think the midfield will definitely be important, but Fleming's a player that I followed for a long time. Um, she, she's a winner. She's got that mentality. Um, she's a leader in this group, and I think that a lot of it will go through her. Uh, and I just, when you, when you ask... A player that needs to get going is, is like a midfield. It's a maestro. It's someone that you need. And that's kind of like my Jesse Fleming. So I, I would say her, although, again, it's it's a collective. Everyone's going to have to be firing, but I'm going to keep a special eye on Fleming because she's just such a special talent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. And I before I let you go, Josh, I want to ask you a couple big picture questions. And the first one is obviously for the men's team, they have the World Cup in 2026. How monumental is that for the game in this country in your mind and and oh and maybe even uh, you can add on that the copa america which they'll probably be in, in, in next year yeah it's it's huge it's the like the hype going into this last world cup was massive but now it's time to continue that hype hopefully turn some of those fans into you know regular canadian fans fans that tune into the canadian premier league tune into maybe mls hmm. that follow the canadian players wherever they may be abroad it, it's about growing the game and you can see that that past world cup definitely did that they put a stamp and it got a lot of interest the copa america is an unbelievable opportunity as well i'm really excited for that tournament winning silverware even like this summer could be a huge deal as well and then hosting a world cup in 2026 with mexico with the us i think it's going to be massive hosting a game in canada as well is going to be it's just going to be wild so i think about about trying to get this country to that next level these next four years will be crucial and there's so much to look forward to if you're just if you're an old fan if you're a new fan there's a lot of unbelievable stories and this <laughs> national team has has proved the last i'd say two or three years that you know the rise is is here and i think that uh, they could do something special john herman believes in this group he believes that he can get some silverware this uh this summer but he also believes that they can do something dangerous in the world cup come 2026. And with that, obviously, there's you at One Soccer, and and One Soccer covers the CPL, and I would imagine they'll probably cover uh, Project Eight, which is the new women's domestic league that should be up in in two years in 2025. What do you think of the impact of the CPL? What do you think the impact of the CPL has had on the game in this country, and how impactful will having finally? It's been way too long having a, a women's domestic league as well. Well, it starts, it starts, it has to start somewhere. And I think having a domestic league is already shown some incredible stories and you've seen that players go to the national team. I mean, Joel Waterman is the poster boy of it, going to Cavalry, doing so well there, getting his move to CF Montreal. He has had some links over to Europe, which would be kind of that next step for him. I don't know how legitimate they are, but I mean, Fenerbahce was one of the names that was floated around wherever he may go or if he goes, but he went from the Canadian Premier League. He went to MLS. He's now in the national team. He's a he's a good player for our national team as well. And then Dominic Sator, he's a little bit older. He's he's 28, but it shows it's also an example of it doesn't matter, you know, the time. Like he could be a, a late bloomer in a way, or just maybe not be in the right situation at the right time. But Sator did so well with York, went to Poland, a country that he's comfortable with. Uh he helped Corona Kelche basically avoid relegation. He's a big part of that. And now he's in the national teams in our nation's league squad right now, which I think Waterman was, he missed out, but Waterman could have been one of those other players that takes a tour spot. So two former CPL players battling it out that are playing in one's playing in Europe, one's playing in MLS. They're doing so well. And it's, it's a great story. I think both of them could have a really big gold cup as well. And for the women. Yeah. I mean, the women's had success stories for a lot of different players. So I'm curious to see what kind of element having a domestic league will have, what type of players will come back and play with it, what kind of younger players who maybe gave up on their dream of going pro because maybe they didn't want to go abroad, maybe they didn't want to go to the US, that they just had to kind of give it up. So know that, knowing that it's there in your backyard might save some careers, which from some of the story, some of the women I've talked to, it's I think is a pretty eye-opening 
opportunity. Mm-hmm. And I guess you could say the same with the men. Some, some guys like just didn't have that opportunity after college. Like, I mean, I, I played college. I don't know if I'd ever be good enough for the Canadian Premier League, but I, I knew that there was nowhere else to go after yeah. besides, you know, having a, a beer and, and chilling and, and playing a Sunday night kind of yeah. game. So um, a lot of, a lot of those guys came from college and I, I played against a few that ended up taking that jump. So it was pretty cool to see. And, and I'm excited to see what that league looks like and what the Canadian Premier League looks like three, four years from now. And all of it will have an impact, especially with the World Cup coming up in 2026. And, and uh, how excited are you for um, for Jeff C playing Messi next uh, yeah. next April in the Concacaf Champions League? How how excited are you for that? <laughs> yeah, Inter needs to win that Open Cup, but uh, that would be hilarious yeah. if they were able to get to that game and Messi yeah. comes to. Uh, I bet you any money that uh, Tim Hortons Field would be pretty packed if uh, yeah. Messi was yeah. going there. I'm not even sure if he if Messi would want to play on on that field not to you know take a shot at any but i don't know i don't yeah. know it's it's uh we'll have to see i'm it curious it is a football field but yeah yeah, yeah. but I, i'm curious to see what would happen if yeah. that was the case but i mean messi's a winner he wants wants yeah. to play wants to get his team uh to that next level so you know gotta take down a, a scrappy little forge fc team he might have to do it yeah exactly um thanks so much josh for for doing this i really appreciate you uh taking the time and doing this um, I, before I let you go, I just want to give you the floor. Is there anything you want to plug for one soccer or anything coming up that, uh, listeners should stay tuned for? Yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of content that the digital team does over on one soccer. So if you want to, you know, learn about the game mm-hmm. in a way and, and, and see the, the premier league, the Canadians playing abroad, we do a lot of awesome work there, but I mean, I just hope with the tournaments coming up this summer, the nations league the gold cup the women's world cup that it's a good opportunity to to learn about some incredibly talented players one soccer will be covering it every step of the way and if you want to learn about the game or want to just continue to follow it one soccer is definitely a great one to do and alex i really appreciate you having me on this was a lot of fun and uh yeah it's a uh, hopefully i've seen you have some pretty big guests on on your uh, yeah. podcast no, so no, hopefully no, i did no, hopefully i, I did I, all right I, 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 uh yeah no uh, i definitely do have some more guests coming up so people should stay tuned but yeah no thanks so much josh for doing this i just love your videos. I've been following you for a long time. So um, people should definitely check you out. And, and thanks so much for doing this. And it won't be a, a boring summer for for Canadian soccer fans. So uh, definitely check out you and, and One Soccer. And I definitely will be. So anyways, thanks so much, Josh. And uh, I'll definitely be uh, talking to you soon about Jonathan David uh, transfers. So I'm excited. Sounds good, man. Appreciate it.